Hi YouTube family, Lisa A. Romano here and thank you for tuning in for today's lesson. So today I want to speak specifically to those of us who have been abused by narcissists, whether in our adult relationships or whether or not we have been abused by narcissistic parents. Um, under that umbrella, I want those of you who are tuning in who have not grown up with narcissistic parents who have not grown up with alcoholism and who have not grown up with overt abuse. For those of you who have tuned in and you're just curious, because I get a lot of that on this channel where people, where people will write me and say, well, Lisa, where do I fit in? You know, I'm not an ACOA. I didn't have a narcissistic mom. My mom was kind of nice, but she just wasn't there. By that, she wasn't emotionally available. And so often, People don't really understand how abusive it is to have a parent who is not there. It is very confusing for a child whose mommy is sitting next to her who she can't connect to. Now, mommy's, you know, off in her own world and for lots of reasons. Maybe mommy has a mental illness. Maybe mommy suffers from depression. Maybe mommy's having an affair and her mind is going... You know, when is he going to text me? When can I see him again? When can I get out of the house? You know, all these types of ideas that distract the adult from the child, that child can feel that space. And I know that I'm guilty of that. Before I came through the veil of uh, unconsciousness or consciousness, however you choose to perceive it, but before I really woke up, I was worried about what my in-laws thought about me. I was worried about making my husband happy. I was worried about getting that validation. I was worried about that great party that I was going to throw and everyone was going to think I was just so fabulous, you know, pat Lisa on the shoulder. You know, um, did I know at the time that I was severely codependent and I was trying to get validated? Of course not. Of course not. Was I aware that in my obsession with trying to pe please people, with my obsession to be needed, did I understand that, that that was taking me away from being able to connect to my children? Of course not. Of course not. I didn't have that data. I didn't have a mom who, or a dad who saw the significance of connecting with me. So... When I became a mom, I didn't have that data. I did what I thought my, I wanted my parents to do. So I told my children I loved them. I played with them on the floor. I you know, did arts and crafts. I praised them. I made sure I was involved with their schooling. You know, um, I was so involved. But that doesn't mean that, that I was present and I think a lot of us need to really, you know, own that as parents. Like, we might go to every PTA meeting, and we might be at every baseball game, but if we're not present for our children, if you're on the cell phone and you're at your kid's game, you might as well not even be there. I think it's worse to be at a child's soccer game or baseball game and to be distracted by a phone call or text messaging or Facebook, you know, messaging and tweeting. I think that's worse. I think that I would prefer, if I was a child playing soccer, I think I might, seriously, and I'm being honest, I think I might prefer my parents not be there than be there but not be there. It's sort of like, you know, when you're married to someone who doesn't connect to you, and it's like, he's there but he's not there, or she's there but she's not there. You know, you're married to an alcoholic, he's there but he's drunk on the couch. She's there but she's always talking to her friends on the phone. You know, she's there but she's always drunk. So it's a sort of the same thing. You know, if, if you put yourself in the child's situation, you know, I know my life exponentially, it, it, it exploded when I was no longer involved with that negative energy because I was being taken away from my internal world by paying attention to the fact that the person I was living with had no interest in being there. All part of my awakening process, but I certainly, certainly have made plenty of mistakes as an unaware codependent. So lots of you also ask me, Lisa, how did you do it? You know, how did you figure these ideas out? And I have to tell you, this is just straight up honest. I figured it out on my hands and my knees. I mean, I remember passing out from pain. 
thinking, I cannot believe my ex-husband just said what he said, and he said that to my brother, and now my brother's going to say that to my father, and then my father's going to tell my mother, and blah, blah, there I go, right down the rabbit hole. So I've been there. And what helped me so much was knowledge and information. And I realized what I needed were coping skills, and I needed mental toughness. I had no, I had a big mouth which a lot of codependents have a big mouth, but they stay. You know, a lot of codependents have a big mouth. They talk about boundaries, but they don't know how to assert boundaries. Completely, two different worlds, dear one. Two different worlds. Like, when you come through the veil and you acknowledge that you're codependent, you realize it's not just about wah, 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 wah. It's about setting a boundary and then being prepared to back that boundary up. So we need mental toughness. For those of us who have been abused emotionally and psychologically, especially if you've suffered narcissistic abuse and you've been gaslighted, I mean, that sucks. So I know that I've experienced gaslighting, and it is, it is so mean, and it's, it's deplorable to think that someone's agenda is to set you on fire and watch you dance, and then to point the finger and go, look at that crazy bitch. Look at her dance. Like, she's crazy. You know, they're sticking you with innuendos and they're insinuating things and they're saying things that no one else can hear and then they flash you a look and you react and he's pointing the finger at you or she's pointing the finger at you. I believe that is so psychologically abusive and cruel. But we don't have to be victim to it anymore. So I want to teach you a couple of things that I learned from studying Navy SEALs. And just stick with me. Navy SEALs are some of the toughest sons of bitches on the face of the earth. Now, most of them don't make it. I think that out of like 140 Navy SEALs that, that are, come into the program, I think only 36 make it. And so a lot of them can't, can't get through all these, all these mental hoops that they have to jump through. So I think it's absolutely brilliant that the Navy comes up with these, this, these um, training techniques to help help those who apply to become a Navy SEAL actually have a better chance of making it through the program. So I want to share with you some of the things that I've learned about Navy SEAL mental toughness training. So um, they call it the big four. And the big four is goal setting, mental rehearsal, which is visualizations, and self-talk, and um, arousal control, which they control through, in a nutshell, breathing. If you go through my channel, you will see, now this is something that I'm just coming into awareness now, uh, but I was amazed because I'm listening to how these trainers are training these Navy SEALs and I'm like, oh my God, that's what I coach. You know, visualization, goal setting, thinking about the moment, meditation, breathing, controlling what you can control in the moment, in the moment. So, um, Theirs was a very cleaned up version and concise, and I wanted to share that with you because I think that it may benefit some of you who are feeling so pulled around by your history, you're still reacting. So let's, let's get very basic, and let's get very scientific. Okay, so Navy SEALs work with neuroscientists, and I've studied neuroscience because I wanted to understand my own brain and figure out where my linchpins were. And so... That's what I was fascinated about, the amygdala and the hippocampus. So when we're children, we're very emotional. Our prefrontal cortex is not wired yet. You have to know that. You have to know that. If you're stuck and you keep reacting and you keep attracting mom or dad or your brother or your sister in your adult life, you have to understand that you're stuck in a pattern. And that when the pattern was created, there was very little connection to the prefrontal cortex. Dear ones, that's huge. Do you know what that means? It's like you freaking Rika. Seriously. Oh, my God. That means that when we were wounded, our amygdalas, which is part of the limbic system, um, pressed the panic button. So we felt fear. Felt fear of what? Fear of being abandoned. Fear of not being loved. Now, when the panic button gets hit or activated, we become hypersensitive and hyper-aware. Our memory kicks in. Amazing. 
That's why so many of us say, I don't have any good memories. Because the brain is wired for you to recall and remember traumatic events. Incredible. So there's, I mean, I can go just go off on a tangent, tangent just on, on that fact and how that's impacted our lives, you know, and, but I'm not going to because I'll save that for another video. So now when we're little, the prefrontal cortex is not fully wired. Get this, the prefrontal cor cortex isn't even wired completely until we're about 26. So that means that when we're little and we're very emotional and we don't have this prefrontal cortex wired yet, the limbic system is very, very active. So we're seeking approval and validation, which is all part of the psychological milestones that we must hit. When we feel rejected and abandoned, it could be the slightest thing. It could be mom turning away when we're crying. It could be we fell off our bike and mom stayed on her cell phone and we feel wounded. And that wound sends a message to the brain that says, this is bad. And what the brain does is the brain, it doesn't have the prefrontal cortex wired yet. The brain doesn't go, hmm, mom is so self-absorbed and there she is talking to her boyfriend again. And sure enough, she's going to ask me to tell my daddy that um, she wasn't on the phone. And there she is acting like she's all into me and taking me to the park. She don't give a damn. We don't do that when we're three. We can't. It'd be awesome if we could, but we can't. We're very limited in our understanding of the world. So the amygdala is highly activated. The hippocampus stores the memory and the pattern that we create to the event. Very, very, very important information. When we're adults now, so now we have triggers. So now if I have this pattern, my mom was very passive aggressive and very sarcastic. And so I'm wired and I'm hypervigilant because my brain is trying to do me a favor. It's keeping me on guard for what I know and I have identified as threatening. I'm not crazy because I'm hyper aware of sarcastic people. What I'm not, I'm, my brain is doing the right thing. Danger, danger, danger. What I have to use my prefrontal cortex now and I have to understand that this danger, danger, danger is my focal point. It is my point of attraction. I write, about in quant I write about it in Quantum Tools to help you heal your life now. Your emotional set point is your attracting point. Huge, dear ones. You got to get out of the amygdala to understand what I just said. You have to connect to prefrontal cortex. That's what all my videos are about. Helping you master and gain control over your mind so that these people that have abused you no longer have emotional control over you and you get to be free and you, you find your purpose. Your purpose is to fly. Your purpose is to become love and light. Why? So that you can become a conduit of pure love energy. So that you can transcend this pain. So that you can become a beacon of light for other people. Your children will watch you ascend. They might hate you now because they're stuck in the pattern, they're stuck in the program. That's okay. Mommy, daddy, just keep getting better because eventually they will see joy in you. It will, you will be illuminated. It will be impossible, impossible for them not to see the joy on your face and the acceptance and the surrender and, um, and, 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 the, and the love that you, that you emit. So you just stay, that is your purpose. That's another point. We need purpose. All right, but I'm going back to the, the, um, the amygdala. So understand, dear ones, that the amygdala stores, stores patterns and the amygdala has been hyper aware since we're children and we have not learned we have not learned to think with the prefrontal cortex but information like this gets the prefrontal cortex activated you know for the rest of the video if you guys do this awesome 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 tap that prefrontal cortex you know it'll help you stay connected like I gotta think here I can't think here I gotta think here blinders this is where the amygdala is in the temporal lobe act like blinders get out of the amygdala Sounds bizarre, but you know what I mean. So now, um, Navy SEAL training, the, when they worked with neuroscientists, they discovered that there were four key areas that helped Navy SEALs that increased the odds of Navy SEALs fulfilling this program. So the Navy SEALs, think about what a Navy SEAL has to do. A Navy SEAL is under complete uh, total stress. 
but he has to be able or she has to be able to override the stress response. So a typical stress response is tied to adrenaline, cortisol. Now the brain stem gets highly activated and the brain wants to either wants to send signals to flee or fight, fight or flee. When we're children, we can do neither. So we freeze. So there are a lot of people that when this flood of adrenaline comes in, it, it hinders the ability of the prefrontal cortex to make decisions. So lots of people freeze. I'm guilty of that. So many times people said things to me in my life and I just froze because they wounded me and all this adrenaline shot through my system and I was just frozen. I, I didn't have the skills to react in a way that was really positive and in my best interest. So I'm sure a lot of you can relate to that, feeling stuck and frozen and waiting for the elephant to slide back under the rug. So what they came up with, I'll, I'll repeat it, it's goal setting. Okay, if you want to be mentally tough around your family of origin, this is going to help you. Goal setting, mental um, rehearsal, which is visualization, self-talk, and what is this one? Oh, um, arousal control, which is we control arousal through breathing. So let me break it down for you. Goal setting. So um, having short-term goals brings order to chaos. So if you're living with parents who are narcissistic and, um, you know, they, they're abusive, right? If you don't set a goal, and it could be as simple as... I'm going to go brush my teeth. So what happens is you commandeer the brain. You, you give your brain direction. You give order to this chaos. It's not about long-term goals. Most when you're, in, when you're in a traumatic situation like now, it's about short-term goals. That brings order to the mental field. So I'm going to go brush my teeth. You brush your teeth, I'm going to clean out the sink. I'm going to spray, out, spray down the sink, wipe it down. I'm going to clean the floor, get out your hands and knees, clean the floor. I'm going to go change my clothes, you go change your clothes. I am going to um, get in my car, get in the car. I'm going to go to the grocery store, okay, to the grocery store. I'm going to find the first spot I can find. Okay, go to the, you find your spot. I'm going to buy my apples and my bananas and, and ciabatta bread, blah, 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 blah. So it literally is taking control, and I say it all the time, over your mental field. You're bringing chaos to the current situation. You're bringing order to the current situation. If you get in the habit of setting goals, eventually you'll feel calm. It's all about overriding the panic response. If you are panicked, you can't think straight. If you're panicked, you cannot grow the neural associations that you need, the wiring you need to the prefrontal cortex. So you've got to, your goal must be to calm the mental field. Mom's going ape shit. Okay, calm the mental field. Your ex-husband or husband's going, going, going wacko, calm your mental field. Do whatever you can to calm your mental field. A great way to do that is goal setting. So, and you don't want to give up. You know, when things are going rough, you don't want to give up because the minute things start to calm down, you're going to hate yourself. So don't make split-minute decisions to bail or go back to a narcissist when things are getting tough. Stick it out. Stick it out. As soon as, you know, the dust settles, you're going to be so happy you stuck it out. So let's say you bail in the middle of a tough situation. You go back to your narcissist. You're going to hate yourself. You're going to, you know, once the dust settles and no one's screaming anymore, you're going to hate yourself. So stick it out. So um, the second thing is mental rehearsals. Now, what the Navy SEALs do, which is very interesting, is they have the Navy SEALs rehearse worst-case situations all the time. It's, so what happens is it's not like that when they're, let's say they're dropped out of an air, you know, a helicopter and there are terrorists on the ground or on the beach and they're coming out of nowhere. So if a Navy SEAL has practiced this scenario many times over, so there's no panic. There's no element of surprise. You know, I got this. The Navy SEAL's like, gosh, 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 I got this, you know? So, so that's how they use it. I want you to use it a little differently. I want you to, because I believe in the law of vibration, the law of attraction, so um, what I want you to do is I want you to visualize having those conversations with mom 
and but not attached to an outcome. I want you to become desensitized to hearing the word no. Um, you're battling your ex-husband in court over child support. I want you to, or, or alimony, I want you to visualize it working out, but not attached to the outcome. So it sounds like this, not attached to an outcome. It would be really great if when I showed up in court today, it was just a very easy process. It'd be awesome if, you know, my ex-husband was, you know, very um, amicable. It would be great if I felt heard in court. Uh, I, I hope that there's not a lot of chaos in the courtroom today. I, I hope that I'm one of the first cases that get heard. You know, I hope the kids are okay with my sister today. You know, um, I hope that we have nice weather. I hope that this isn't a drawn out process. So it's visualizing the desired outcome, not attached to an outcome, not attached to it. So it's all about going general. Esther Hicks says go general. Because when you attach to an outcome, you create a cinder block. So you're saying it has to be this way. And guess what happens? If it shows up any other way, you're going to be pissed off. So now you're in a negative vibration. It's all about paying attention to your vibration and going from, so if you're down here in your, vi whoa, if you're down, wait a minute. If you're down here with your vibration and we want you up here, what we want to do is we want to find ways to get you to be able to take, take control of your vibration so you can get higher and higher and higher. So going general helps you ascend. Attaching to it an outcome drops you down because if it doesn't work out that way, you're in a negative situation. Okay? Hope you're writing this stuff down. Um, so uh, this, the third thing is self-talk. Fascinating piece of information. The average human being has 300 to, let me just make sure I get the statistics right. I believe it's anywhere from 300 yeah, to 1,000 words per minute, per minute, um, pass through the mental field. 300 to 1,000 words per minute pass through the mental field. Imagine, dear one, if you took responsibility for that. No, I'm not kidding. Imagine if you, if you took responsibility for those words that were flashing across your mental field. Navy SEALs do it. If they can do it, you can do it. If they, do, if they can do it, and if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for you. It's good enough for me. This, personally, I think we should be teaching kids, you know, in, in, in nursery school how to do this and teach them that they can flow their consciousness. I call it FYF, flow your focus. So it sounds like this. And every time you find that your mind drops, I was just, you know, I just blew out my hair before. And I'm blowing out my hair. It's something I do all the time. And so I find that I don't need a whole lot of attention to do it, mental clarity to do it. And sure enough, when I'm blowing drying my hair, doing something mundane, my consciousness drops and these thoughts that aren't even mine begin to surface because the brain, the brain, well, the mental field just, it's like, it's like, it's like the sky holds a cloud. The brain holds thoughts and the brain can only play with the clouds that are in its sky or the brain can only play with the tools that are in the shed. So, but you have a choice because you're a conscious, evolved human being. So you get to choose what thoughts are in this mental field. But imagine, dear one, if you said, huh, 300 to 1,000 words per minute pass through my conscious field. Oh my God, no wonder I hate myself. I am constantly talking about what's not going to happen. You know, I know that before I gain control over my mind, I was thinking, you know what, when he says this, then I'm going to do that. When she does this, I'm going to do that. And oh yeah, I know what she's thinking. She said this, but she meant that. I was driving myself crazy, and I was actually using visualization to my disadvantage. To my disadvantage. I felt critical of myself because everyone was critical of me. I thought people were talking about me because I, they did. <laughs> I grew up with people talking about me and making me feel less than. So I wasn't crazy for thinking that other people were talking about me, that was a fact. That was a fact. I didn't know at the time that I had control over whether or not I made that an important aspect of my life. So when I accepted that people were talking about me, and when I accepted that was evidence of their low, their, their low level of self-awareness, it was easier to let it go. So... Um, we need positive self-talk. So what's that sound like? So that sounds like um, I, tell, I tell all my clients and those that, that, you, that um, 
that take part in my teleclasses and group coaching classes, we experiment. It's positive self-talk. So we're driving in the car, and it's now, I do this. That's a beautiful tree. I love this music. That little girl's so beautiful. Oh, my God, I love the color of that balloon. Wow, that's a great pair of shoes. Wow, that's a great car. I'd love to own that car one day. Wow, look at that house. Man, I wonder what the, what the foyer of that a house looks like. I love her hair. I wish my hair was that color. That'd be awesome. Um, oh, that's a nice-looking couple. They look so happy. I deliberately do that because I want to, A, maintain my vibration and, and keep it higher, and I also want to send information to my brain that tells it what I want to experience in my life. The brain needs a target. That's how the subconscious mind works. You give your brain a target, and it goes to work for you. The universe conspires to meet you. And you will start to manifest differently. So take control over your self-talk. So when Navy SEALs are in the jungle, they're not saying, I can't do this. If they hear themselves saying, I can't, they go to, yes, I can. I can do. I can do. I can do. I can get to that next mile. I can get to breakfast. I can get to this next drill. I can, again, short-term goals. Go up. Short-term goals. I can swim to that buoy. I can get my um, partner over that ridge. I can make it to that tree. I can now make it to the next tree. I can now, so it's I can do versus I can't do. Imagine if you took responsibility for that. Imagine. It would be amazing. So remember, you're downloading consciousness, downloads the brain, and gives it direction. So the fourth thing that the Navy SEALs do in their elite training is arousal control. So what they teach their SEALs is to control their breathing. Very long expirations. That helps control the panic button in the body. That helps to override the impulses of the amygdala, which is panic and fear. They use all of these techniques um, to help Navy SEALs, especially past their water training. So what, the, what they do, what the um, coaches do is they, they put these Navy SEALs in pools of water and then, they, then the coach comes down and undoes their oxygen hose and the Navy SEALs got to stay calm. So very slow breathing, I can do this, I've got this, all I've got to do is undo this wire or undo this hose, then put the mask back on. Again, very short goals. That's what helps these SEALs get through this training. So imagine if you set incremental goals every day. Every day. Small goals every day. Imagine if you were teaching your mind to come forward. That creates forward moving momentum, dear ones. I don't care how mundane the goal is, just set a goal and achieve it. And it will grow. It will, it will, it's like that song, you know, just put one foot in front of the other. Um, and soon you'll be walking out the door. So imagine if you set small goals every day. And that was your purpose every day. Imagine if you, instead of rehearsing and beating the drum of situations you don't want to happen, like, I know my boss is going to say no. I know I'm not going to get that job. I know I'm not qualified for that job. So-and-so is so much more qualified for the job. I know she was being a bitch when she wrote that, wrote me up. I knew she did. I know she did it on purpose. I know she's talking about me behind my back. Um, imagine if your, your visualization shifted to... I know she's talking about, my, about me behind my back, but that's okay. I can't control what comes out of other people's mouths. It would be really nice if she started picking on someone else, you know? Or it would be really nice if she got transferred. That would be awesome. It would really be nice if I was completely unaffected by how she felt about me. It would really be nice if her attitude changed. That would be awesome. It would really be nice if I got a raise at work without having to ask for it. So that's your plan. That's part two. That's you're taking care of your mental visualizations. Part three is the positive self-talk. Imagine if you took control. That's like I think I I think I heard somewhere that that was like 270. Oh, oh actually, those are impulses. Impulses travel through nerve impulses. Once your amygdala, amygdala senses fear, nerve impulses travel through your body at 270 miles per hour. That's incredible. That's insane. 
So that's why we have to be mentally tough when we're in these situations with others because we are patterned to react and we have to get out of that state of reactivity. And these tools will help you. So number one, one is the goal setting. Number two is the mental rehearsal. Number three is self-talk. Remember, you're speaking 300 to 1,000 words per minute to yourself. Take control over that. Um, and the fourth thing is arousal, arousal control, which is what, how, what I coach my clients on, is that's why I think meditation is so important. You must slow down the mental field. So if I'm, if I've come out of a meditation and I'm very zen, you know, I'm mu shin, I'm very calm, and um, I stub my toe, my reaction to stubbing my toe is going to be a lot more controlled and a lot less, ah, oh, damn it, ah, 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 I won't do that because I will have taken myself back and now I'm in control over my reaction. So I really hope, dear ones, that this information inspires you to do your own work. I keep all my information in, in binders just like this, well, like this. I find something that's fascinating about the brain, I write it down. Um, it's your responsibility to take care of your vehicle, which is your body, and it's your responsibility to take control over your brain or your mind. It's your responsibility to take care of your soul. Don't worry about other people. You have a specific purpose. If you've been led to this information, know that I am a manifestation of what's resonating in you. Or this information is a manifestation of what's resonating in you. If you are hearing the message, you're meant to hear it. Now, will you act on it? It depends. That's all up to you. So, dear ones, I hope this has inspired you. Um, my purpose is to bring information to you as I receive it. Why? Because it brings more love and light to my planet. And I believe in sowing kar karmic seeds now while I can. Why? Because I will not be here one day physically. And my children will. And my grandchildren will. And my great-grandchildren will. And so I believe in investing in myself and becoming as much love and light as possible and helping you become as much love and as much light as possible so that we can keep the planetary vibrations high and know this also, children that are being born now are being born enlightened. They're coming in. Now, the more of us, in my opinion, the more, and this is something that's just, I believe, the more of us who awaken, the more of us who stay turned on and enlightened, the more children that are going to be born enlightened. Because children coming in will match the vibrations of the souls that are here. So it is, that is your purpose, dear one. I don't care how bad your life is right now. You have a purpose. Your life matters. Even if nobody in your experience ever tells you that, your life matters. Dear one, it is my honor to be your breakthrough life coach. I look forward to your emails. They keep me inspired. For those of you who are interested in taking part in my next teleclass, you can reach me at healingselfesteem.com. My Loving the Self Affirmations 2 hat is published. I don't know when it's going to be available on Kindle and Amazon, but an iPad and the Nook. But as soon as it's available, I will send you a shout out on Google+. Plus. If you're not in my Google+, Plus community, please look me up. Google+, Plus Adult Children of Alcoholics, Codependents, and Empaths. Stuck in the past no more. Namaste. Bye.